What if the shadows lurking in the woods were not just tricks of the light, but echoes of something far more sinister? Have you ever felt a presence watching you from the darkness, or heard whispers where there should be silence? Tonight, we delve into the spine-chilling world of skinwalkers, creatures that defy reality and blur the lines between myth and horror. Join us as we uncover four true horrifying skinwalker stories that will leave you questioning every rustle in the trees and every flicker in the night. But before we start, I just want to give a huge shout out to all of you. Your support is the heartbeat of this channel, and I'm beyond grateful for this incredible community. If you are enjoying our content, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss a spine-tingling upload. And if you want to support us and help us grow, there are a few simple ways you can contribute. Sharing the videos, leaving a comment, or even checking out our support options on Patreon or Ko-Fi would be greatly appreciated. Your support makes a huge difference and helps us keep bringing you top-notch content. Thank you again for being a part of this journey with me. And now, let's dive into the darkness together. I grew up in a small Navajo community in New Mexico, surrounded by vast desert landscapes and deep cultural traditions. We often heard stories about skinwalkers, shape-shifting witches said to be able to take on the form of animals, particularly coyotes and wolves. These tales were told around campfires, usually as warnings to respect the land and its spirits. One summer evening, after a long day of hiking with friends, we decided to camp out near a secluded spot close to the cliffs. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting eerie shadows across the landscape. We set up our tents, gathered around a fire, and shared ghost stories, laughter echoing through the stillness of the night. As the fire crackled and the stars began to fill the sky, I noticed my friend Jake seemed restless. He kept glancing towards the trees at the edge of our campsite. Did you guys hear that? He asked, his voice low. We all fell silent, straining our ears. At first, it was just the sound of the wind, but then I heard it, a faint rustling, almost like something was moving through the brush. I shrugged it off, thinking it was just an animal. We continued with our stories, but Jake couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Later that night, after we all turned in, I woke up to a strange noise outside. It sounded like a low growl mixed with a sort of chattering. I felt a wave of unease wash over me. Peeking out of my tent, I saw a dark shape by the trees. It was hard to make out, but it looked like a coyote, its eyes gleaming in the moonlight. Just then, I remembered the tales of skinwalkers. They were said to mimic animal sounds, luring people into the woods. My heart raced. I wanted to wake the others, but I hesitated, fearing I might panic them. Suddenly, the creature let out a chilling howl, but it was different, almost human-like distorted, and unnatural. I felt paralyzed with fear, staring at it as it remained motionless, watching us. The growling escalated, and I could see it shifting, as if it were about to change form. Gathering my courage, I crawled back into the tent and shook Jake awake. There's something outside, I whispered urgently. He groaned but sat up, the sleep still heavy in his eyes. I described what I saw, and his face went pale. Let's wake the others, he said, his voice shaking. We woke the rest of our friends, and as we huddled together the sounds continued, rustling, growling, and that haunting howl. We tried to rationalize it, convincing ourselves it was just a wild animal, but deep down, we knew it felt wrong. As we debated whether to pack up and leave, the growling intensified and we heard something heavy moving through the brush. I could feel the air grow colder, an unsettling energy settling over us. That's when we heard a voice, a whisper that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere at once. Help me, I nearly screamed. The voice sounded human, but it was distorted, as if it were echoing off the rocks. It felt as though whatever was out there was trying to lure us closer. We decided it was time to go, adrenaline surging as we scrambled to pack our things. Just as we started to gather our gear, 
The dark shape dashed out from the trees, revealing itself in the dim light. It wasn't a coyote, it was a figure, tall and gaunt, covered in fur and shadow. Its eyes glowed an unnatural yellow, and it stood on two legs, watching us intently. We screamed and ran, abandoning our campsite, racing towards the car parked a few yards away. The creature followed us, its movements swift and silent. I could feel its presence close behind, a sinister energy that seemed to feed off our fear. When we finally reached the car, we fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking uncontrollably. As soon as we got inside, we locked the doors and sped away, not daring to look back. The last thing I saw in the rearview mirror was that figure, standing at the edge of the trees, watching us drive away. To this day, I can't explain what we encountered that night. Was it a skinwalker, or just our imaginations running wild? All I know is that I'll never forget the chilling howl and that piercing gaze. We left the desert that night, forever changed, with an unshakable feeling that some stories are rooted in truth, and some things are best left undisturbed. After a recent conversation with a friend from my days of leading supply caravans on the Navajo Reservation, I discovered an intriguing incident involving one of the participants from a couple of years ago. This friend and I reminisced about our experiences, and I learned about a remarkable encounter that one of the women from our group had. I managed to get her contact details and reached out to her. Let's call her Amanda. During our chat, I interviewed her about her experience and I want to share it while honoring her culture and the sensitive nature of the event, so we've altered names and certain specifics to maintain discretion. For some context, the Peabody Coal Company has mining leases on land around Black Mesa, an area known for its dry, rugged landscapes punctuated by shallow terrains and dry creek beds called arroyos. These arroyos are known to flood during rare, heavy rains, a phenomenon not commonly seen in Arizona's high desert. One sunny afternoon, while trying to retrieve a lamb that had escaped, Amanda found herself lost in this challenging terrain. She had been following an arroyo, hoping it would lead her back to her friend Johnny's compound. Unfortunately, as she navigated the dusty paths, she began to experience an asthma attack, likely triggered by the swirling dust in the air. As the attack escalated, Amanda felt her heart racing and spiraled into a panic, which caused her to lose consciousness. When she finally came to, she was disoriented and found herself surrounded by darkness. Rising to her feet, she strained to make sense of her surroundings. It was then that she heard a twig snap behind her. Turning, she thought she saw a figure ducking behind a tree. In the moonlight, it looked like her friend Charlie from the caravan, and she felt a glimmer of hope. Believing he had come to help her, Amanda called out, Hello? Is someone there? I think I'm lost. After a moment of silence, the figure cautiously emerged from behind the tree, appearing to beckon her to follow. Feeling somewhat reassured, Amanda trailed behind him as they walked deeper into the draw. They had been walking for about five to ten minutes when suddenly, another figure appeared, seemingly materializing from the shadows. A sharp bolt of pain coursed through Amanda's head, akin to a severe migraine, and she had to pause. Looking up, she was met with an even more unsettling sight, three additional figures standing in a semicircle around her. These figures did not resemble humans at all. Instead, they looked like large coyotes, and she could see ten glowing eyes fixated on her in the dim silver light. Overwhelmed with fear, she instinctively began to back away, but the coyotes remained still, their gaze unyielding. Panicking, Amanda turned and sprinted away her heart pounding in her chest. She ran for what felt like an eternity, about five minutes, until she finally paused to catch her breath. Just as she did, she heard another twig snap. Turning around, she was horrified to see one of the coyote-like figures standing on its hind legs, emitting a bone-chilling scream that echoed through the night. It was a sound she had never heard before, an amplified coyote howl twisted with a reverb that sent shivers down her spine. The intensity of her fear drove her to keep running, adrenaline coursing through her veins. Eventually, she stumbled upon a service road and flagged down a Peabody mine worker who was driving by. Desperate for safety, she explained her situation, 
mentioning their caravan leader Buck, who could clarify things with the worker's manager. As she climbed into the cab of the truck, relief washed over her. But when she glanced in the rearview mirror, her heart sank. The haunting eyes of those figures reflected in the red glow of the brake lights. She couldn't tell if they had followed her, but the fear lingered. Once they arrived back at Johnny's parents' home, Amanda rushed inside, her heart still racing. Despite the language barrier, Johnny's parents spoke limited English. She managed to convey the essence of her terrifying experience through broken sobs and frantic gestures. They listened intently, concern etched on their faces. The next morning, Johnny's family called a medicine man to address her unsettling experience. Although nothing overtly supernatural seemed to occur overnight, the medicine man blessed her and the house, invoking a sense of peace. Everything seemed to settle down, yet the memory of that night remained etched in Amanda's mind. As a precaution, Johnny's family decided to cut her trip short, wanting to ensure she returned home safe and sound, away from the haunting shadows that had chased her through the desert night. Every year, my family would embark on a camping trip in Wisconsin with some close family friends. It became a cherished tradition, and without fail, my dad and his best friend Billy would lead the kids, my sister, myself, and several others, on what they called a snipe hunt. If you're familiar with snipe hunts, you know they're essentially just a playful prank. Snipes don't actually exist. It was merely a way for my dad and Billy to concoct thrilling scenarios to entertain and rile up the kids. They painted vivid pictures of snipes as aggressive, bird-like creatures that lurked in trees and emerged only under the cover of night. As children, we eagerly absorbed every word, captivated by the idea. Each year, my sister and I would become more and more excited, convinced that this would be the year we finally spotted one of these elusive creatures. This particular year was no exception. On the second day of our trip, with everyone settled comfortably into the campsite, my dad and Billy set their plan in motion. They gathered all the kids, announcing that tonight they would attempt to catch a snipe, claiming they had heard one the night before near the RV. Naturally, all the kids buzzed with excitement, a mixture of thrill and trepidation coursing through us. My sister and I were practically bouncing off the walls, eager for the adventure. The day dragged on until evening began to fall, and my dad called us together. Some of the kids armed themselves with sticks for protection or battle and one particularly imaginative kid had even brought a wooden sword. As we ventured into the woods, my dad explained that Billy had gone ahead to scout the area. The air was thick with anticipation, and the excitement was palpable. After about ten minutes of walking, we heard rustling in the trees, and all of a sudden, Billy burst out, covered in red and screaming that a snipe had gotten him. The sight sent the kids into a frenzy. We all screamed and took off running, and being only eight years old, I didn't realize it was just a prank, so I bolted too. In my panic, I ran without direction, racing through the woods until I spotted a large tree with a bush beneath it that seemed like a perfect hiding spot. I scrambled under the bush, doing my best to remain quiet and suppress my tears. A few minutes passed in silence, and then I peeked out cautiously. That's when I saw it. There was something moving, resembling a dog, but its legs were unnaturally long and thin. Its head looked mangled and deformed, and I could see patches of hair scattered across its strange body. My heart raced, and I had no idea what this creature was. As it walked by slowly, I could hear faint, mournful moans, which sent chills down my spine. I felt a mix of fear and fascination. I didn't want to look, but I couldn't tear my eyes away. The more I stared, the stronger this overwhelming sense of dread became. Years later, I can only describe it as an all-consuming fear that left me feeling disoriented. At that young age, I didn't fully understand what those feelings meant, but I remember being in a trance, caught between curiosity and terror. Suddenly I heard my name being called, accompanied by the sound of crunching twigs and leaves in the distance. The creature stopped in its tracks and fixed its gaze on me. Just then, my dad reached me, grabbing my arm and pulling me up scolding me for running off and explaining that it was all just a joke. I could sense he was overwhelmed with emotions, relief, frustration, concern. But all I could focus on was the creature I had seen. I turned to look back, 
desperate to see if it was still there, but it had vanished without a sound. As my dad and I walked back to camp, I recounted my experience, suggesting that it might have been a snipe. Of course, he dismissed my claim, assuring me that snipes weren't real, and that year was when I finally learned the truth about them. Looking back, I'm still unsure of what I encountered that night. For years, I comforted myself with the thought that it was just a large coyote, but deep down, I knew it wasn't. It wasn't until I learned about skinwalkers, creatures from Native American folklore said to be able to shapeshift, that my gut told me that's what I had seen that night. To this day, I have no explanation for the creature. It could have been anything. After all, I was so young then. Yet even now, when I take bike rides or hikes in the woods, I sometimes catch a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye, a flash of movement that sends a shiver down my spine. Each time I can't help but feel that same mix of fear and fascination, as if that creature is still out there, watching me, waiting for the right moment to reveal itself once again. It was around November of last year when I had just moved to Washington State. Being new to the area and fond of the woods, some friends, who were avid outdoor enthusiasts, invited me to a secluded spot. I thought, why not? I needed a break from work anyway. I got the weekend off, packed my bag, cleaned my rifle, and headed over to my friend's house. We drove about 25 or 30 miles away from the Canadian border into a forest that seemed endless. I was thrilled because my home state didn't have anything like this. There were six of us and two dogs, a Labrador and a Rottweiler. Each person carried either a hunting rifle, shotgun or handgun, except for me. We parked our cars on a tiny dirt road used by game wardens or border patrol and hiked about four miles into the woods. By the time we arrived, it was already getting dark. We decided to build a fire immediately so we could set up tents. Two of the group along with one of the dogs, went out to gather wood while the rest of us set up the tent. It was one of those huge six to eight person ones. November gets cold up there, but the tent was set up in about 15 minutes. The trio still hadn't returned, so we started a fire with some branches around the site. Suddenly, we heard crashing noises headed our way, like someone was running full speed. The two guys came barreling through wide-eyed, but the dog was nowhere to be seen. They started yammering about seeing one of the other guys out in the woods acting weird. When they tried to get close, he would move away. At one point, he just disappeared and then popped up not ten feet behind them. They mentioned a really bad rotten meat and spoiled milk smell. They tried asking what was up but there was no answer, and then he took off sprinting into the woods. The dog followed, barking its head off, and they lost both him and the dog. The smell disappeared too. But then they heard a weird screeching, followed by a loud dog's yelp. The smell returned, accompanied by what they described as mad giggling. They got out of there and back to the camp, angry at the dude, but all of us vouched for him. Soon, we were all weirded out, though I thought it was an elaborate joke. As it got darker, we built the fire up and brought out some Coleman lanterns. We huddled around the fire, eating MREs, our guns close by. About 15 minutes after dark, the remaining dog, the Rottweiler, started growling aggressively. The smell came back, and the guys weren't wrong about it. It was awful. We started hearing groaning and branches cracking around the perimeter of our camp. The dog went ballistic, and Greg, one of the guys with a shotgun, stood up and fired three rounds of buckshot randomly into the woods. A hellacious screech came out and moved away from us fast, and the smell dissipated. We decided to try and get some sleep, with two people on guard at all times. The first watch was me and another guy, Victor. Two hours in, nothing happened, so we woke up Greg and Tom for their turn. After being asleep for a little while, I woke up to that smell and Greg yelling. We headed outside, and Greg was looking around the edge of the woods with a spotlight, calling out Tom's name. Greg and Tom had been sitting when they heard one of the guys from earlier calling out from the woods. The dog rushed to the spot and Tom followed. He lost both in the bushes, and when Greg heard Tom begin to say something before being cut off, he realized something was wrong. We all put on some clothes, grabbed our flashlights and guns, and headed out to find Tom. The smell was everywhere, making us nauseous, but we kept going. 
We found some of Tom's tracks but lost them when they just stopped, with no other footprints leading back. One of the guys at the back made a weird noise, then yelled at someone in the woods accusing them of being a jerk. We walked over to see Tom standing about 20 feet away, but something was off. He stood there, deadpan, and slowly nodded when asked if he was okay. A few of us supported him back to the camp, where he just refused to lay down, so we let him stay by the fire. Greg, Vic, and I decided to stay up and keep an eye on him. He did weird, jerky muscle spasms every now and then. We thought it might be something serious. He was mostly quiet and slow to respond, except when it came to food. He only ate the meat from an MRE. Then he got up and started moving around, looking towards the woods. He asked if we wanted to come into the woods for firewood, despite the pitch black and the huge stack of firewood we already had. We stayed on guard and didn't try to stop him. Greg got up a few minutes later to step into the tent for something. I was outside with Vic when the smell hit my nose like a ton of bricks, and I gagged. Then I started hearing gibbering and giggling. I'd never been more freaked out in my life. Vic and Greg felt the same. Greg went inside to wake everyone up and froze at the tent flap, cursing. Apparently he did a quick body count inside, and realized there were four bodies instead of three. Someone or something had been in our tent without us realizing it. We all lost it and started asking where Tom was. The gibbering got louder, and nonsense was moving through the woods. Tom's voice called out, but it was off-key, and he started giggling. We built the fire up and sat around it with all the lanterns on full and weapons ready until sunrise. As soon as it was light enough, we packed up and headed back to the vehicles. The giggling and smell returned, and we just got out of there. Back at the cars we found scratches all over them, most of the windows smashed, and the seats shredded. We just needed them to run, so we started them up and sped out. We didn't talk about it for months. Later, one of the guys told us he saw Tom at the edge of the woods as we left, with a creepy grin on his face. I believe him. I'll never go camping that far away again without more people, but I believe that was my first run-in with skinwalkers. If you've experienced a terrifying event, or have a horror story to tell, we at AG Horrors want to hear from you. Share your experiences with us, and let's uncover the mysteries hiding in the shadows together. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel for more spine-chilling stories like this one.